In the Family was sponsored by the Champaign County Anti-Stigma Alliance. These movies are killing me. Roger really did a great job of programming, didn't he? I told you we had the director, Patrick Wang, with us, and also the lead actor in the film. Patrick Wang was featured in Filmmaker Magazine's 2012 list of 25 new faces of independent film. He's previously worked as a director in theater and has a collection of his short drama published as the monologue plays. In the Family is his first film and has received the film site Hammer to Nails 2011 Golden Hammer Award. I told you that the weather prevented the other actor, Trevor, from being here with us, but surprise, Trevor made it be <laughs> despite the weather. And so we're going to present thumbs to Patrick and Trevor. Trevor St. John, his first major acting role was opposite Glenn Close in the TV movie Serving in Silence. He has worked both in television and film. His film credits include The Born Ultimatum, The Kingdom, My Soul to Take, Payback, Crimson Tide, Dogtown, and Higher Learning. Nate, will you help me present the Golden Thumbs to Patrick Wang and Trevor St. John? on yet? Uh, thank you so much. We, uh, we usually screen in uh, much more modest settings than this, so <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you I've never felt so simultaneously distant and, and close to my audience at the same time. Thank you. And Patrick and Trevor joining you tonight will be Michael Barker is going to be the moderator and then Kevin Lee, a film critic, a filmmaker, and producer of over 100 video essays on film and TV. Michael and Kevin, please join them. Wow. You know, um, it's moments like these, I really feel the massive loss of Roger Ebert because I am going to be so inept at dealing with how great this film is. I think, yeah. I cannot think of a film in recent memory that has the emotional intelligence of this picture. And I think we should start off by recognizing not only the screenwriting and the direction, but this is the fourth time I see it, and it is a staggering performance in this movie that you've given. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and there's so much to talk about. You know, when you watch the movie uh, externally, it feels like you're watching a movie like Kramer versus Kramer, Kramer. But then what you realize, it's all about 
you know, the, the subject of race, the subject of gay marriage and race and gay marriage never come up as words. And I, I would like you, first of all, a question I've always wanted to know. I just met you last night and you don't have a southern accent, so he's not the real guy, okay? Because <laughs> it feels like he's the guy, right? So uh, the, the first question uh, is really, you're, you're obviously a renaissance man. And the, what little I know of you, you have a degree from MIT, you have, you've had a, a, a very wide varying background. Can you tell us how this movie came to fruition and how it came out of your own experience in life? Okay. Um, well, I, I think it came like my life um, in a roundabout way, in uh, pieces, in, in a lot of surprises. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think anyone ever sets out to be a Renaissance man or something. You, you just, you follow your curiosity. And I think that going to MIT was a wonderful thing because the arts there, there aren't barriers to entry. What did you study there? I studied physics and then economics. Wow. And, uh, but there are a lot of artists at MIT. And they haven't gotten the memo that you're not supposed to participate if you're a scientist or an engineer. And so they do. And they are some of the most creative people I've ever met. And that kind of just permission to try anything for any reason and not really care about a career or the outcome. I think that spirit is what I learned there and what has helped me in kind of just getting into when diving in. When you graduated from MIT, did you see yourself as a future filmmaker at that time? No, I was, I started a theater company pretty soon after MIT, and uh, theater was my love, and uh, I directed, I acted in theater, and it wasn't until a number of years later that I started thinking of film as a possibility when I moved to New York, and yeah, very slowly, and, um, and not, again, not always in a straight line. I, uh, I, I, I dabbled in it for a little while, stepped out for a while, and this film kind of just came with a force. All the elements came together, and suddenly it makes a lot of sense. The things you've done all throughout your life, they kind of lead, or they're, they're useful in this particular endeavor. They've taught you enough that you, you say, okay, I can actually handle this. Are these characters you knew in real life? or No. Um, I, I find other people and other lives much more interesting than my own. I mean, I think, you, and it's hard, to, it's hard to avoid yourself, you know, when you write and when you make something, you're going to be there, whether you want to or be or not. And so I try to have elements that stretch me, that take me into new places. But I mean, there's things that I had good parents, you know, I've seen love, I've seen all these wonderful things before, and of course they're going to inform it, but I don't like them to come in the details. Um, I, feel, I like to free myself of the details and invent new ones. The movie is perfectly cast, and how it's unbelievable the cast, including this gentleman to my right. And yeah. <laughs> how, tell us how you cast all of those actors, because we've seen them in a lot of different places. If we're, you know, they've been around, and then how you came to Trevor. Yeah, um, there were two actors that I had, I've always in my park overall, who plays Trevor's mom in the movie, and uh, Brian Murray, who plays Paul, my lawyer, in the movie. I've always loved their work, and they, they seem to fit so naturally into this film, and so I just talked to them directly. And everyone else, we had an open call, and I, I love, when, I, when we ran theater, the theater company, I loved, I loved auditions, and I loved meeting new people. Um, that I didn't know, and I love actors, and so that was some of the most fun I had was meeting all these great actors in New York, and many of them that we weren't able to cast that I've, I've still fallen in love with. And, um, and, and Trevor was, you know, for all the responsibilities I had on the film, what is really valuable is somebody who's going to take you somewhere you didn't quite expect. And there were two actors, um, Trevor was one, and Peter Herman, who plays Dave, the brother-in-law. Uh, he was the other one who, there were actors who gave, came in and gave exactly the performance I thought, I imagined. And they were really thoughtful, prepared actors. And then there was Trevor and Peter. And, you know, they gave you most of what you were expecting, and then this thing from, that seemed out of left field at times, and I love that. 
And, um, and I love, particularly with Trevor, how it keeps changing. Uh, the scene where the two of you come together is just such a staggering movie, a scene. It's, it's so logical, it makes total sense, and you understand the whole relationship with that one scene where they come together and they kiss. The question is, how many times did you shoot that scene? How, how did you, <laughs> you know, I, how do you come to a scene so perfectly? <laughs> Yeah, Trevor made fun of me because we did shoot that scene a lot of times. Um, that was, and, and it's, it, we, we could never guess. Certain scenes that, that seem technically harder, like the flashback with Trevor, where his wife has just passed away. You know, that's, that's one 10 minute take, and that's pretty, pretty difficult. And, you know, it makes it into the, the film with no cuts. And that, that we only did one camera rehearsal and two takes with. Um, and so that came fairly fast for how complex it was. Um, there was something that the camera is actually a big part of that scene you're talking about. And it took a while before the camera got the right performance. Because it is the first time really we see a balanced flashback. Everything else is always cheated towards him and focused on him. And it's the first time we have a formal balance to them in this memory. And to find the language in and out and how we got there uh, took the camera a little while. That's your first film. How did you learn that about the camera? You watch. <laughs> you, um, I, you watch and you, you notice. You know, I think we, I'm also not, um, you know, I'm not 20 anymore. Um, and I think that changes how your first film comes across too. But I, you know, I, you watch a lot and, and I think that that's something I've noticed has kind of been having never directed a film before. I was amazed how many of the departments kind of descend when something is a little out of place from what you'd expect before people look at it and try to evaluate and say, what is in front of me? People rush in to change it, you know, squeeze it back into the box you were expecting and I just love to watch. And sometimes you watch and you say, yeah, this is terrible. <laughs> Let's fix it. And then other times you watch and you're like, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin, um, I have seen this video essay Kevin has done on the film, which is going to be on the DVD, which is released soon by New, New Yorker Films. At, yes, at the end of June. So if you yeah. go to our website, our Facebook page, you'll get an update for when, when that's available. But in this uh, uh, excellent video essay that Kevin has done, he talks about Patrick's use of space. So I wonder if you could comment on that. Sure. Um, you know, I like to think of this film as incredibly generous towards the viewer. And, um, you know, it's, it's amazing to be in a space like this to watch this film, the Virginia Theater. It's this wonderful house that Roger has invited us to be in. and. Uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, now, now, now I want to go on this little tangent because, you know, um, I can't help but think of Roger watching these films, and I can't help, I don't know about you guys, but I can't help but think that Roger is somehow speaking through these films, the, the films that he selected for us. Uh, with Van Gogh, this uh, earlier today, I just felt like in some ways I was like reading Roger's blog, just the way that there's this onrush of words and this, this all consuming hunger for life that's, you know, in that film, and it just felt like the spirit of Roger. And in this film, I'm sorry, I'm gonna get a little sentimental. Um, you know, how does a family stay together after someone leaves it? Um, and I, I like to think that Ebert Fest is the family that Roger created um, and that we're all a member of. And I really believe that this film is in the spirit of the Eberfest family staying together just as it did in this film. And, uh, you know, a family that lives on. Um, a family not necessarily made of blood, of, but of spirit, of soul, um, and, and a connection that you, that you feel. And uh, Chaz, uh, Nate, Mary Sue, the University of Illinois, um, all of you have done so much to bring this family together, and it will continue for years to come. Um, so anyway, uh, 
matter of space. Yeah, you know, the video essay that uh, that I created for the DVD and, and uh, Patrick, on top of being everything else, is an amazing DVD producer. This is one of the most loaded DVD packages that you will find this year. So uh, it's got like two two extra bonus videos, two essays, and so on. Um, in the video essay, I compare this film to Hollywood films and to uh, and to even like art house films like Amore, which I believe uh, Sony Pictures distributes. You know, these these are known to be like you know very slow and deliberate films, um, but I mean this film is just so spacious. The the length of scenes, you know, there is a at first you're kind of wondering, okay why isn't this cutting, why isn't this moving on? But you realize that you're in the room with these characters and you are invited to sit with them, to be in the same space with them, to observe them interacting with each other. And that's just a completely different experience where, you know, I, I, I compare it to Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln is almost about the same length as In the Family. Lincoln is 145 minutes long, In the Family is 165 minutes long. In the Family has 280 shots. Lincoln has 800 shots. So that's like almost two and a half times more shots. So you're getting more cutting, you're getting more movement, you're getting more like, you're being told what to look at, you know, through the grammar of the film's construction. Whereas here, this is a space you're spending time watching and he does so many things playing within that space. You know, a lot of stuff with like, where you see just the edge of a person and you're being made to look outside the space. You know, you hear someone talking and you're like listening outside. It's just sort of like you would hear voices in the next room. And so it's, it's just this very organic and very open architectural approach to constructing a space. And I think this is something very unique in American cinema. And so I, I thank you for introducing this to us, and I hope that there'll be more films that push us in this direction of how to watch a movie and how to appreciate it. One of the things I, I found so remarkable about it, which is so hard to believe it's a first film, is the confidence in where to place the camera. You really knew where to place the camera. And the, and the reminder throughout the film that this guy is alone, and his goal in the film is not to be alone. And you do it spatially with chairs around a table and just him with his back. And it's, it's a, a mise-en-scene that's really, really impressive. And uh, um, it's, it's pretty amazing. Trevor, tell us what it's like working with this guy. Well, it's uh, really an actor's dream because uh, you know, Patrick uh, is willing to take risks and he encourages his actors to take risks and that's the kind of environment in which I want uh, to perform. Um, and he, and he, um, he trusted, at least he trusted me, I don't know how, I, I assume he trusted all the actors, but he trusted me, that he made the right decision in having me play the part, and he let me go. And that again is a, is a situation that you dream of. Um, and he, he allowed things to happen, I'm, I'm thinking about the conversation about space, he allowed things to happen as they do happen, instead of instead of some technical uh, um, way in which he, he fears the audience might want it to happen or, uh, or some critic might want it to happen. He lets things happen as they do. And so he let me, whatever rhythm, fast, slow, whatever, violent, uh, uh, peaceful, and anywhere I went, it was, uh, he, he said, okay, let's see where that takes you. And it was a very respectful way to work, not only to me, but I think to you all. I mean, that he really respects his audience to, to allow the space and the time uh, for things to happen in, in human time. And, and it was just, it's a real um, pleasure. It was a really uh, wonderful Yeah, you know, that's, that's a way to establish this feeling of truth, even though it's a fictional story. And that probably comes from a lot from your background in the theater, right, Patrick? Yeah, I, th I think that what... What theater taught me was one, how to work with actors and talk with actors, and two, how to work and talk with designers. And I think that is the basis for how I think in film. Um, but it also shows you, you know, you have a setup, you set the scene, and you understand what the actors can do to activate that scene. And so you, you're right to point out this, this tremendous cast. 
And it's one of those things that, you know, you can have individuals who are great in your cast, but when you get that rare situation where the whole cast adds up, there isn't a weak link in the cast, um, you get something many more times over. You get a world, you know? And, uh, and so I can, you know, I can do all the setup and the construction and the planning and, and have all the theory I want about how, to, how for the, I want this to work, but it's really those actors activating the space and how they can move you across a wide shot and how they can change the feel and the focus of the wide shot. And the key, I guess, is making feels, actors feel so comfortable in that space. I mean, we realize that when we see how amazing that little boy is. I mean, he is just amazing in the film and, and no inhibitions whatsoever. You don't feel he's acting at all, you know. It's really an amazing thing. I think that I, you know, this is something I feel very strongly in and I feel sometimes like a minority voice, but I think that the kid was acting the same way the adults act. And adults and kids can be very spontaneous with scripted dialogue, with these planned scenes, repeating scenes. I feel like it's their job and they're very good at it if you let them do it. And so I, I feel like the expectations for what scripted drama and performance can do has, has changed. Is there a specific reason you chose the South? Because it almost could have taken place anywhere, the story. You know, here I'm gonna borrow, one of the nice things about having other people talk about your movie is they come up with these great phrases. And so I've used emotional intelligence after I've heard Michael use that. And then Kevin, he talks about signal jamming, and I love that. <laughs> There's enough elements there that with, with the race, with the location, with the family, that it jams some signals, and I'll use another phrase he uses, that it creates kind of a negative space for, um, for really an open mind. I think that this gives everyone some element that is familiar and somewhere new to go. And I think that if you didn't have it in the South, in this particular size town in the South, um, you wouldn't have that opportunity for as many people. I think it would feel mar far too familiar or far too unfamiliar for a lot of people. I thought it was because, Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do not believe there's ever been a film where the lead is Asian American and has a great Southern accent. <laughs> right, at, le at least not as comic relief, you know. Yeah. So, and this is something you pointed out when we talked about the film, the opening sequence where the boy goes into the parents' bedroom and at first, you know, you're not sure who's in the bed and then very slowly you see, you know, Patrick's character emerge. It's like, holy cow, there's an Asian guy. What's he doing? You know, so you're, you're as a viewer, your brain is processing this. And then you hear an off-screen voice, another male voice, like, wait, who's that? You know, and so you're piecing, and this is what I mean by space, this is what I mean by slowly assembling uh, a story, a world, um, a series of meanings that you, the viewer, have to piece together. And one thing I noticed for the first time, and it's actually like the most significant sort of um, plot line that's almost buried, and you have to pay attention to realize what it's all about, the last question that that attorney asks your character, have you ever been a pedophile? And then you think, that's where the sister, that's, that's her thinking, you know. At least that's my interpretation. And that's why they were so cold, because they were paranoid about, oh my God, this guy is going to molest um, the boy. I mean, that's, that's just sort of, so, but, but it's not spelled out. I mean, that's, that's room for you to interpret and for you to kind of, and so, so much of the film is this open space for us to project, you know, all sorts of issues regarding racial prejudice, sexual prejudice, and so on. Well, I was gonna say, I mean, I've seen this film a few times. When I saw that moment in the film and the close-up on your face, it is one complex moment. You're not sure if he's gonna say, it's like, am I shocked? Is, is it remotely possible someone could be asking me this question? There, there are just so many things going on in your reaction in that moment. It's, it's really something. I have one other question. How long is that deposition scene? <laughs> I, I think someone said it's about 35 minutes. Okay, and how long did it take you to shoot that scene? 
it was just under two days. Wow. We shooting that scene. That's amazing. Yeah, it was a lot of, I mean, part of it was wonderful because the two wide shots you see are, we did as a complete take of the scene. So we had 35 minute takes from each end of the room. And um, as a director who's also acting, it's heaven because for 35 minutes, no one gets to ask you questions, except the lawyer, you know? <laughs> and those are easy compared to the set questions. <laughs> so, so it's this great relief. And, um, but you had amazing actors to sustain 35 minutes. You know, excellent actors. And you forget Eugene, who plays Jefferson, um, because I think sometimes because you don't like his character. And, but he is so good. He is so good, and he has actually, next to Joey, the most lines in the movie. It's, um, but he, sneaks, he, can, he can work in and out. He keeps it moving. He is a wonderful presence, a really great actor. We should open up for some questions. Yeah, I had a question. I was um, over you? here to your right. <laughs> Sorry, I have to think backwards. Um, <laughs> I noticed in the credits, am I mistaken, was your father played by Chip Taylor in the film? Yes. The Chip Taylor then? Yes. Okay, that's wow. all I wanted to ask. I mean, <laughs> other than how was that and how did you get to get him into the film? I assume it wasn't just hey, we're using your music, you want to come and play? Or how, how did that work out? That was pretty much it, yeah. <laughs> I, I took the, you know, asked him what is uh, shooting. I didn't know Chip before, but he was so generous. He, he, you know, he read the script and he was, uh, let us use his music and, and he was around and, and was able to make this cameo. But I, I make fun of Trevor because, so Chip Taylor has been your dad. And didn't you do a movie where Chris Christopherson was your dad? So next... <laughs> Next movie, Barbara John Strike. Prine will be your dad. Barbara Streisand, <laughs> Barbara Streisand produced one of the first things I did. Right in front of you. Stand up, please. Um, Trevor, your, your character is so intelligent, clearly intelligent in that film, and, and obviously you are too. I'm just wondering, uh, could you tell us something about how you got into film and, and, and your background that, that makes you so good for that character. Well, I don't, I don't know if there's anything in my, in my background uh, that I wouldn't know. I, I, if I, I'd have to have more time to think about that, what's in my background that, that would connect me to the character, but um, I appreciate that <laughs> you've, uh, you think I'm intelligent from just sitting up here for a little while, but uh, um, um, I, think that, I think that what it is is, in my, I'll tell you what my, I'll tell you what it is. It's, that I'm not afraid to um, to let myself be a fool, and I think that that required uh, that was what was required for the for the role, because in that, for instance, in that flashback scene, um, the long one, the long take scene, there was uh, there was every level of feeling. There was great uh, deep sadness, and, and then there was fury, and then there was and I'm constantly looking for in what I do in those, in every moment. How, where else can I go? And uh, I think maybe that's what, maybe that's what you latched onto. And I'm guessing that's what, when Patrick met me, that's what he saw, is that I'm not afraid to, I'm afraid all sorts of, of all sorts of things in real life, but, you know, but in acting, I'm, I'm not afraid to go wherever I go. And I think maybe that's, I hope that that's what you meant. Yeah, I think that's it. Question from the balcony, up here, up here, to your left, there you go. Uh -huh. Stand up, please. Um, so there's no film school here, but I'm part of the art program, working mostly on video, and we don't, at least from my experience, we haven't been emphasizing dialogue or soundtrack, it's mostly imagery and figuring out the right audio. How did you come for this specific story to use such precise framing for the imagery and so in such a way that it's kind of like an artistic piece rather than just cinematic? Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I, I think part of that has to do with 
it being a first time film. And I think that a lot of people get very entranced with the longitudinal cut, your cut between scenes. And I was entranced with what you can do with these four sides of your frame and the poetry that can exist in what, because they, they cut off certain types of information and they include other types of information. And uh, so I think it was that kind of, that was so new because that's a flexibility you don't have in theater unless you have a big budget or a lot of movement or other things. It's very hard to change your field of view quickly and easily. And so I thought that was very interesting. And so I think I thought differently, about, I thought a lot about composition because that was a new tool I had. Um, and, and then the rest of it is just what looks interesting and new. And I think I find beautiful, I find beauty in sometimes expected ways and sometimes very unexpected ways. And so I would just go wherever it would Can be. Can I just say, you know, I don't want to interrupt, but I, I, I think what you're seeing is a, is a person who trusts himself and um, I don't know, I've never, well, I've directed a, a, a small film before, but nothing of this scope. And uh, when I hear you ask a question like that, I, it gives me a lot of hope because I, I would like to impart a sense of, uh, of self-trust into you. And that's, I think that's what you're seeing with him. So I, this is, he said, this is what I like. And it might work for other people, it might not, but this is what I like. And all the great artists I've ever met, and I aspire to be that way, when I make a choice as an actor or whatever, I said, this is what I like. And uh, I hope people like it. If they don't, well, okay, but this is what I have to go after. Does that, make, does that sound like you? Did you change a lot of the dialogue on the set or have improvised uh, sequences at all? No, I, I think I didn't make it a hard and fast rule that we wouldn't. Like when I worked with Trevor, there was no like, you know, line notes and word notes. Um, so that we could find it. What I don't like to improvise text, but what I would encourage actors to do is to improvise the emotion behind it. So you can make something featured, you can make it a throwaway, you can make it mean the opposite of what the words seem to be saying. I like that kind of improvisation. But I feel like when everything is up in the air, sometimes you have nothing to hold on to and, and the scene kind of just um, lives in limbo. And so I feel like let's, let, let's set some things not a lot of things, but we'll set some things and it'll give us a way to go. And fortunately, everyone worked really well like that. And the kid was very impressive. All his lines were scripted. And he had, he had a tremendous memory and a tremendous um, emotional intelligence as he, as he made his way through the, the text. It's hard to write dialogue that natural and that good, you know? I, uh, I, worked, I used to teach kindergarten kids, so five and six I know pretty well. <laughs> Got another one here, house left, and unfortunately this will have to be our last question. Patrick, what's the future of this film? Because people need to see it, and what's the next film? Thank you. Thank you, I, you know, I, I feel the same way, and I am so grateful to all our champions um, who have felt the same way and made the opportunity. You know, we, we opened in New York 18 months ago, you know, a few people noticed, and then a few more as we've made our way to, I think we've played in over 100 cities now. And, um, and you're all here because of what Roger Ebert did. And every city I go to, there's a couple people who are in there because of what Roger did. And uh, so we're kind of winding down, I think, the piece of this that I can push. I think 18 months, I'm, uh, it's, it's a nice way to end. Here is a nice way to end. We have um, next week in Austin a couple screenings. And then in June, uh, at the end of June, we'll be out on DVD and Blu-ray uh, for other people to discover. But I hope these kinds of screenings will still happen, where we can get a big screen together. Um, I've got prints, and, uh, and we, can, we can show it and, and kind of experience it together. Patrick, I have another word for you. It's called Evergreen, and this movie is going to be an evergreen for many, many years to come. It's a fact. Thank you. Thank you also. Thank you. I, there's one important person who I think really should be thanked, actually, someone behind the scenes who actually advocated to Roger, and she had access like no one else, uh, Carol Iwata, uh, Roger's assistant, who saw this movie, loved it, and kept telling Roger to see it. So 
now you kind of have, now you know the secret of it. So Carol, good job, Carol. The takeaway from this film is that it really gives you a lot of faith in people, in human beings, in the future, and part of that future are these two guys right here. Thank you.